Hi everyone, it's Eve Ellie Bloss from SpiritGirl.com and welcome to the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today in this online audio and video space and with our very special guest, Selena Caesar Chavain. Van, yeah. there, I got it. And she is the best-selling author of Can You Hear Me Now, which is a bestseller, and it has officially launched in Australia, and I'm super excited that we're here today and we're going to share more of Selena and her book and help to inspire and empower you to be your authentic self. But Selena is a business coach, a business consultant, international speaker. She has done her time also serving the people of Whitby And she was a parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister of Canada. And she has been in Parliament, which is so incredible for being a woman. And more importantly, let's get to the real crunch. She's been in the Oprah magazine. (laughs) Now, let's talk about status. Oprah is one of the most incredible people, women in the world, one of my absolute role models. So, Selena, um, credit to you for being there. But you've also a business, successful entrepreneur. You had an award-winning research management consulting firm. So you come from business. Mm -hmm. You also have a Bachelor of Science that you got from the University of Toronto, uh, bachelor in healthcare management. The list goes on and on and on and on. But you've also um, a member of the Congress of Black Women. And I know from watching all of the book launches going on, there is this hype and excitement that you've written this book, Can You Hear Me Now? And everyone's super excited that you've moved from politics to just wanting to empower other women and other people right around the world. And now you're free to say what you want, when you want. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? So we're going to help you today, our podcast listeners. Super honoured. I've got goosebumps and um, really grateful to be here because Selena's met so many incredible people, which, um, Selena, I'm going to give it over to you now. Welcome to the podcast show. Welcome to the Spirit Girl community and welcome to Australia virtually. Oh, my God. Eva, <laughs> thank you so much for having, having me. And I'm going to say hello to your mom um, because... <laughs> I just want to make sure that I, she knows that I acknowledge her and that I thank her for her her support and her love. Um, you know, I'm so, you know, my 16-year-old daughter, Candace is the only one from, we, we're a traveling family. We love to travel. But my 16-year-old Candace has been the only one who has traveled to Australia. And so I'm just so excited to be in Australia with you. <laughs> Yeah, it's so exciting because your book's been published by Penguin uh, Random House, isn't it, with Canada, Um, and it's just launched and it's sort of like women are reading it and resonating with it and they're just and then they're telling other people and it's just sort of like that whole eat, pray, love thing happening where Everyone reads it, shares it, and it's such a good feeling. But for our audience, can you tell them a little bit about yourself in your own words? Oh, I think. Oh, yeah, that's good. Can you hear me now? So, yeah, or, or, yeah. I hear you now. Um, awesome. yeah. Can you hear me now? I had to plug you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Can you hear me now? That's actually a good thing to do in the podcast show. I love <laughs> it. I purposely mute myself, so I say, can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> I love um, that. But- awesome. I'm keeping that part in the podcast show. That's too good to cut out. <laughs> but uh, Sorry, that was not intentional. But, um, yeah, my name is Selena Cesar Chavan, and I am – Currently, I serve as a senior advisor for equity, diversity, and inclusion at Queen's University in uh, in Canada. It's in Kingston, and uh, really, uh, obviously, an author. 
but formerly a member of parliament with the federal government of Canada, parliamentary secretary to Justin Trudeau, parliamentary secretary to international development. And uh, previous to that, uh, an entrepreneur, I, I used to run, uh, own a healthcare-based research management firm, which ran clinical trials, uh, obviously with the vaccine and COVID, everybody's talking about clinical trials. So I used to run that nationally with, uh, internationally within Canada and the United States. And, you know, running Canada's or co-chairing Canada's first epidemiology study in neurological conditions. So really passionate about the brain, passionate about equity, passionate about mental health, and passionate really right now about transforming lives of, of people who are quite often marginalized from our society. Yeah, when you talk about marginalized, can you share a little bit about that? So for someone in Australia who has really, you know, never been to your country, never experienced anything, can you give us a bit more insight to that? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I you know, when people think about Canada, oftentimes they think of it as like, you know, this, this place that values diversity and values uh, multiculturalism, values human rights. And we do. Um, but especially when I was parliamentary secretary for international development, I was very clear to say that even within Canada, we have our own situations. Um, the situation with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is a, a national shame. And it's something that we really need to, to speak about, especially when we think about the fact that some of these, these missing and murdered women and girls who are indigenous to Canada are like as, 50, as young as 15 years old. At one point, when my 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 eldest is 21 years old right now, and uh, I remember when Tina Fontaine went missing and then was was found murdered. She was 15 years old at the same time as my daughter, and it breaks my heart. And it's one of the reasons why you know I got into politics. I I'm really passionate about advocating for equity, because when we when we talk about intersecting identities, when we talk about people who are marginalized, we're often talking about women, women of color, uh, persons with religious minorities, uh, persons who are with disabilities, uh, individuals who are too old and too young, who are pushed aside from the power dynamics that typically maintain the status quo. And I'm here to say, no, no more pushing aside. We're gonna rattle the cages and we're gonna be up front and center because when you protect those individuals, you protect us all. Yeah, well, thank you, Selena, because we don't get that kind of news uh, generally about what's happening in Canada. Like I had um, no idea, sadly, about that young girl or what's going on and my, my heart goes out to her family and friends and community and, and that's just terrible. And the thing is we hear, uh, when we think of Canada, we think of Michael Bublé, um, you know, and we think of these uh, skiing and these um, beautiful kind of like lakes. Yeah. And that's about it. That's our kind of perception. Yeah. So it's interesting to actually see that there's sadly a lot of crime still going. There's crime there with the... Uh, young and indigenous, indigenous. yes yeah yeah but that's I, really sad yeah you know it's interesting because my my daughter my 16 year old Candace was at, at Clayfield College in Australia uh, this time last year and you know the, the same thing she went there and they were talking about the skiing you know out mm -hmm. in Alberta and you know Lake Louise and and great tourist attractions great you know Justin Bieber, Michael Bublé, Drake, right? Um, but I think at the end of the day, when we're thinking about the, the sustainable development goals, when we're thinking about how we move forward post-pandemic, post-conversations globally about racial inequality, we have to center ourselves in, in the challenge, center ourselves in the fact that there are things that we need to do differently that we need to take accountability of some of the things that we're doing wrong. I mean, certainly account for the things that we're doing right, but there, there are challenges everywhere. And when we think about, you know, our, our federal prison systems, for example, um, over-representation of Black 
and Indigenous people here in Canada. Our, our child welfare system, over-representation over of Black and Indigenous people here in Canada. Missing and murdered women, I already talked about. Um, and our education system, there's a lot of work to be done. And while we could sort of highlight some of the good things that, that we're doing, we also need to pay very cognizant attention and think about global solutions to some of the systemic problems that exist in all of our countries. Yeah, and that leads me on to the next question, because you're very passionate about transformative leadership. And yeah. I want to ask you that. How, what is that? What does it mean? And how can we apply it? Because you share an empowering message that each individual, regardless of your title or your background, can make a difference. So can you share more of that, Selena? So my philosophy and my sort of values and uh, principles are, are really anchored by this notion of transformative leadership. And I'll give you the, the definition that Dr. Carolyn Shields gives. And she says, transformative leadership requires leaders to, to have a sense of their values and beliefs. And those values and beliefs are the foundation by which they, they take stands that require moral courage. That they live with tension, meaning, uh, Yvette, that they're not afraid to have awkward conversations. They're not afraid to, to push the status quo, to, to go against the grain, and to some degree engage in advocacy and activism that is required, especially after 2020. 2020 wasn't just a series of of historical, you know, moments with a pandemic and global conversations about racial inequality. It was a call to action. It was a call to action for transformative leaders to say, I am not afraid to stand in moral courage. I am not afraid to have these conversations. I am not afraid to act to to engage in activism for people that I know need it the most. I'm not afraid to use my privilege and my power to do what is right for the greater good, to create equity in our systems. Yeah, I think touching on that, we saw obviously in 2020 uh, a lot of world news that it, it, it happened with uh, in America. There was an incident there, obviously, with the George Floyd. Yes. And then that triggered uh, so much unrest even in Australia with their own Aboriginal, Indigenous people. It raised, I think, a lot of trauma. It yeah. triggered a lot of trauma for many people yeah. who had suffered that history. Um, and then it also raised a number, uh, raised a lot of awareness. I, I sometimes didn't know whether to feel whether people were just doing it to jump on the bandwagon like, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and let's just put a photo up of every black person now and let's get black people on magazines and let's get black people in our thing. And I kind of felt like you got to be the real deal. If yeah. you are 100% passionate about this, this has to continue now forever forever you can't just put up a whole heap a bunch of black people photos and then like yeah. in a year's time go oh that social media trends over oh okay on to the next one so mm -hmm. I think um from someone who was sitting back and unfortunately at the same time that world event happened my mother had had a seizure and went into a coma but from someone sitting back um I just felt that if people are going to do this on Instagram or social media, grandstand, whatever, they have it has to be real. They have to feel it. They have to believe it. We cannot have utter bullshit. Like that would be the best way to say it. You've got to mean it. You've got to feel it. Yes. And if the, and and I really just hope that every person out there that was expressing um, inclusion, uh, inclusion and, and treatment of all people, whether you're a criminal, whether you 
you know, regardless, but just treating of people. Um, I just hope that their, their heart was in it and their heart stays in it. Um, that's so, really important for me. Ab absolutely. You know, and, and you, you said something first, I, sh I should have started this conversation by acknowledging where I am. Um, I, I, I feel a, a great kinship with, our indigenous brothers and sisters globally. And I have to say that I'm speaking to you from Whitby, which is 40 minutes east of Toronto in Canada, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, the Scugog Island in, uh, in, in Turtle Island, uh, as we call it. And uh, it's Williams Treaty territory. And especially as a, a black settler on this land, who is an unsettled settler, I, I feel that I, I need to acknowledge the interconnection between the fight for racial justice, for anti-oppression with my indigenous brothers and sisters. So I, I do that out of, out of respect and out of um, honoring uh, uh, the traditions of indigenous, indigenous people. But you know, I could see where the trauma would come up again when you think about what happens in the United States with the modern day lynching is what happened of George Floyd. And how, the, because it reverberated around the world, people were then able to express some of the trauma. And again, the intersection between the trauma and the uh, the removal from their lands, the loss of identity, the rape and the murder that happened with indigenous people. There is a connection with black communities across the world. And I think that that connection uh, joins us together in arms when we fight oppression and we fight racism. And so, you know, it, it, to the indigenous people in Australia, you know, you have allies around the world, you have kinship around the world as, as we struggle. And when we think about the, the performativeness of individuals who put hashtag Black Lives Matter or Black out their screen, we don't have time for that anymore, Yvette. I got to be clear. We don't have time for that. If your heart is in the right place and your intentions are good, you can keep them. We're not interested in your heart in the right place. We're not interested in your good intentions. We're interested in action. We're interested in being substantive. We're interested in understanding that you know how inequitable the world is and that you are going to, with your privilege and your power, create a system of equity for all of us. And equity, Yvette, does not mean that I'm going to cut into your slice of the pie. Equity means that you join forces with me to bake a bigger pie so we all get a slice and we all could eat, right? Like this this is how we have to think about th things. And I, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge where some of my forcefulness around equity comes from. You know, you talked about your mom having a seizure and being in, in a coma. And my, my research background was in brain research and understanding how caregivers, how challenged they are and getting into politics because I wanted to see that equity being established so that caregivers could take care of their loved ones that they had the right tools, that they had the resources to be able to do so. And so um, I'm just gonna speak to the last thing that you talked about, you know, irrespective of whether you're someone who's in healthcare or in the justice system. And you talked about, you know, irrespective of whether it's someone in jail. Brian Stevenson in his book, Just Mercy, speaks about the fact that we are more than the worst thing that we've ever done. We need to have mercy. We need to live with grace. And our advocacy needs to be stemmed in our values and principles and the ability to extend grace and to extend mercy to other people. Oh, that's so beautiful, that message. It's gorgeous. I, um, it's really good that we're having this conversation today because I, I feel that there are, like, you talk a lot about climate change. We've got the pandemic uh there are so many the refugees there is it's sort of 2020 just bubbled everything up and but more importantly we have your book now and a lot of people are feeling uh maybe afraid to say what they think they're probably worried 
there is this consensus if you talk out of line that you could be perceived as ranting, angry, negative. Because there's this notion that everything should be really positive on Instagram and, you know, we should just be going along with the flow and, and everything should be positive. Now, we know for real action to happen that we have to speak truth mm -hmm. and, and share our stories. And even though the story might not be a glamorous one, it's a story of truth and and the more we can share stories the more we can learn and more we can have empathy but for someone out there who's got a story and they're so frightened to sh talk about it their experience but they would love to rise up and maybe do a vlog on it a video blog or maybe one day they want to do a TED talk on it or maybe they just want to even tell their mum Maybe they're just so frightened even to tell anyone. Can you help them how to overcome the fear of sharing something that isn't the most glamorous story in the world? So Yvette, thank you for that because when I wrote this book, Can You Hear Me Now? I could have written it a different way. I could have written and talked about the awards that I won, the lectures that I've given internationally, the things that I've accomplished. I could have written about all the, the glory of Selena. I didn't write that book. In the pages of this book has every mistake that I've made, everything that I felt ashamed of, everything that I was scared of, every hurt, every, I, I have a knot in my throat just talking about it, every hurt every pain. And I wrote that for a couple of reasons. I wanted people to know that they weren't alone in the mistakes that they made. Usually you see Selena, she's a parliamentary secretary to Justin Trudeau. Ooh, and she's like a member of parliament and she's a successful entrepreneur. And oh my God, she's so fantastic. No, I'm a regular human being who has made mistakes, who has had shame, who's had some glory and some success, but it came with blood, sweat, and tears. And so do we all. We all have had those moments where, we're, where we want to hide, where we want the earth to open up and we fall in and it never sees us again. And I wanted to write a book that said, number one, you're not the only one to make a mistake. And clearly I am here with you. Um, number two, to know that it's okay to make mistakes, that you could pick yourself up, dust yourself off and live after that. And number three, as someone who lives with major depression and anxiety, and oftentimes has my mistakes overwhelm me, when we think about suicide rates and rates of mental health, one person committing suicide or one person doing, you know, because of how they are feeling is one too many. And I want them to know that if they could just hold this book and say, I didn't make as many mistakes as Selena did. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> totally okay. <laughs> oh, I love how you just like, you could have had the shiny book, the everything's really sweet. Everything's easy. Oh, that was just, you know, but you it's really opened easy. up, you really yeah. opened up. And you, in your book, there's a song, you refer to one song. Can yeah. you share that song for our listeners? Yeah, so before I share the song, I want to say that um, before I actually knew the song, it's hard to understand our value, how much we're worth to the world. And I'm not just to the world, let me take it down to the micro level, to our relationships, to the organizations that we're part of, our job, our community, our school. It's sometimes hard for us to understand our value. And anything, Yvette, that you or your listeners put their time, their resources, their energy, their love into needs to get a positive return on that investment.
If you are with someone who ain't giving you a positive return on your investment of love, you need to kick them to the curb. (laughs) Well, the song is Nina Simone, You Gotta Learn. And you gotta learn that when love is no longer being served, you need to walk away. And that is such a hard lesson for us to understand and to actually appreciate. But when you're no longer getting love, for the energy, the time, the resources, the love that you're putting into your job, your community, your relationships, you got to walk away when love is no longer being served. I love that. You've got to walk away when love is no longer being served. And I can resonate with that because I once used to be an Aussie farmer and that system is not set up to return <laughs> any money actually like the system's broken and it didn't matter how hard I worked there are just things that happen out of your control and if it's um not in um it's if it's detrimental to your health I've learned this if if it's detrimental to your health and it's not serving your best it's time to move on um because there are just some things that just Uh, are too broken of a system to be fixed. (laughs) But now, Selena, I want to ask you, um, you do so much talking on TV, uh, podcast shows, um, on the stage, of course. You've spoken in Parliament and all of your careers. Um, Do you, before you do a talk, when you go on stage, um, any tips for someone before they go on stage? So should they rehearse their speech? Should they know what their key point's going to be? Um, any tips on preparation for a talk? For me, it's obviously doing a lot of research on you um, <laughs> from a podcast show point of view, but for someone who's got a lot of nerves, and they're going to go on stage or they're going to do a pitch, a pitch to someone, how can they feel confident and and sure of themselves? So there's a couple of things that I'd say to that. Um, Number one, fear has allowed human beings to survive since the beginning of time. So fear is essential. It activates the amygdala, it activates the parts of the brain that allow you to do the fight or flight mode. So don't be afraid of fear. It's something that we need to survive. So number one, say, okay, I feel afraid. It's probably because I'm about to do something really big. So love that for part, first of all. Say, yes, bring on the fear. Bring on the, 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 the sort of butterflies in my tummy because that means you're about to blaze some trails and you're about to do something real dope. So that's number one, love the fear. Then after you get the fear comes in, then this little person comes in your head called the imposter syndrome, right? Where she, she creeps up and she says, well, you can't, it's actually not fear. You actually just can't do it right? This is what the imposter syndrome is. <laughs> And I don't actually call my imposter syndrome an imposter. I call her my chief mit- risk mitigation strategist, right? Because there's a, your, your parts of your body, you're supposed to acknowledge that. Y- your body's telling you, we've been through this before, you might fail, and I want to tell you how you're going to fail. A- acknowledge it, listen to it, and then tell her, your chief risk mitigation strategist, why you're not going to fail and write it down. I'm not going to fail at this speech because I've prepared, because I'm qualified, because I know what I need to do, because I know what I need to say. Next, do your research. So if you're going to be talking about something that is data driven, your opinion is great. But Yvette, your opinion, my opinion is not what the world needs to hear. They need to hear actual evidence of, of to support your anecdotal stories. So your anecdotal stories are fine, but have the evidence to back it up. And then, you know, I, I would I would say lastly is that just do it. I love it. I just love it. Just do it and show up. Just do it and be honest. Be honest, be your 100% authentic self. Nobody could take away from your authentic story. Stories are sticky. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you're going, make sure that you tell part of you. 
leave part of your story in there. Even if it's the shameful bits that I talked about earlier, even if it's the parts that you're like, I'm embarrassed about that, but I learned from that experience and this is what I learned. That's what people want to know. They want to know that you're human. You're a human being. You're not a robot. So this is where you want, this is where you get like excited. This is where you inspire people by talking about those things. So don't, don't be afraid. Show up, be authentic, bring a little research. Don't be afraid of fear and acknowledge the imposter that They are incredible tips for our audience. Thank you, Selena. That is so amazing because there'll be people, whether you're a guy or a girl, uh, public speaking is now something that every business has to do on on social media um, or any person is now having to rise up to become a public speaker. Now, you are such a driven person a high achiever, and you've overcome many obstacles. Like when I was researching about you, you immigrated to Canada. Yeah. Originally from... Grenada. Yes. You didn't realise that Canada was going to be freezing cold. Um, (laughs) I thought that was hilarious, that part. I have to share that with you. Uh, So it was a real different eye-opener wasn't it with the cold weather because it's you're now in um the coldest months have just gone by haven't they january yeah, february, january we're, which we're are really tough world. yes um when it comes to filling up your own cup so we're going to move on to selena you've worked in uh, a really high profile job which involved a lot of tv And for some reason, the media and the news really like reporting every day on politics. I don't know why. Really, I just don't know why they're so obsessed with it, but they do that here as well. But for someone that lived a really public life um, with the media just wanting to chase you around and get your opinions and report on everything, you talk about how you focused on your career, on your job, giving it your all, serving your people of Whitby and of all people of Canada, and then you had your children, but you've discovered that at that point you were not taking time out for yourself, self-care, self-care wasn't happening, and your relationship with your husband was on the down low he was (laughs) self-care and and relationship went out the window now you've learned from that though selena can you share your tips on i guess now how you build in self-care and you've had this really big awakening that self-care is so important as a woman or for anyone like you yeah. now your self-care priorities like whoa yes way up here and family and then you're kind of like going to settle in oh, I love that you got your nail polish there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is good because you're on a self-care podcast show mental health podcast show we got your book book yes. podcast show so we're going to just really dive into self-care now yes Yes. So, so there's a couple of components to self-care. So um, number one, filling my cup. So, uh, you know, I write about, you know, the breakdown of my marriage in my book. Me and my husband are still together. We we managed to reconcile, but I write about, you know, self, the the breakdown of my marriage. And I remember in the last couple of, of years of being in politics, I would say to my husband, I don't have capacity in my cup for you. And I have, I have to do my job and I have my kids. And that's all I could fill. I don't have me in my cup and I didn't have my husband in my cup. And as I was writing the book and really writing down about all of the pains and the hurts and the shame, as I was writing these, I found my cup was emptying out. And I was, I was wondering like, why is that happening? And then I realized I was getting rid of all the garbage that I've been holding on to my whole life. All of those things that were consuming me 
um, all of the things I felt ashamed about, I was holding on to, and it was consuming me. And as I as I was writing about it, as I was putting it in the pages of the book, I realized I was letting it go, and my cup was getting empty. And then I was able to put myself and my husband, as well as my work and my children, back in the cup. And there's more space. So number one, let go of the garbage. Even if you just write it down and burn it, just let it go. You need to let it go. The second thing is that, you know, often, Yvette, we want to have, we want people to have confidence in us in spaces when we walk into spaces, but we don't have confidence in ourselves, in our own space, in our skin, because we're too busy going, oh, that's so flabby, and this needs a nick, and that needs a tuck, and these needs a lift, and all these kinds of stuff, right? And so what I've done is, whenever I step out of the shower, I step in front of a full length mirror and I look at myself without the Instagram filters, without all of the, you know, the things that make me look pretty without the makeup, without the clothes. And I say, man, look at this. This looks fantastic. And that takes practice to be able to do. The third thing that I do is I really acknowledge my mental health. I live with major depressive disorder and anxiety. And when I, I'm very compliant now, I wasn't always compliant. I've been compliant for two months with my medication. It's very difficult to do. And I want to acknowledge to people who have mental health struggles that it's very difficult to do. I'm very compliant. I meditate. I eat well. I exercise. I do the. I do a whole bunch of things to deal with my with my mental health. And lastly, when it talks about doing things for myself, I do my nails, Yvette. They're not. I know they fancy. look gorgeous. They're beautiful. They're, they're not. Everyone fancy. tuning in, you got to go to the YouTube channel, Spark Girl. They look amazing. They look amazing, but I do them myself, and because oh, that's I, have, good. I have my nail file always closed, and I have my nail polish always closed. You know what, Yvette? When you paint your nails, you have 15 minutes. That short of holding a glass of wine, honey. There's nothing <laughs> you can do with wet nails. <laughs> Oh, that is so good. It's a, it's a quick 15 minute me time that gives you me time for yourself. You can't type anything. You can't write anything. You could have a glass of wine, maybe a cup of coffee, maybe a tea, but you, you just could take some time to have a break. And Yvette, if you're really in a bad mood, you put on two coats, that gives you 30 minutes. You put on three coats, <laughs> you put on four coats is an hour. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is so good. And, you know, thank you for opening up about your uh, health struggles because we had a very big stigma in Australia. I believe that everybody suffers with depression and anxiety. Like, I honestly believe this and whether people are on medication or not, like I know growing up um, my father is Aboriginal and my mother is French. Um, I'm Australian born but I grew up with a lot of, uh, I guess, trauma from ancestor, uh, ancestor stories, um, a lot of shame. Yes. A lot of shame, embarrassment. Like I remember being in school and it was grade seven and then one of the boys was actually doing, I think, work experience and the little bugger went into my file and he found out I was Aboriginal and then he told everyone else, see, because when you look at me, I don't look Aboriginal. So I kind of like have gone under the radar but then I remember all the kids laughing at me and then it was this big thing and, you know, it was this very big heavy thing and, yeah, there was a lot of trauma I think that comes from just when maybe you're in a room and people speak badly. Like once I was at work um, and I like I've said this to mum, this really can get your mental health down. Yeah. Because if you're because if you're hearing a lot of negativity towards whether it be you you associate even though they like I've learned now that I am not other people's actions right so even if there are Aboriginal people who might do crime or um, generally they get all the press but there are still other people from other cultures doing the crime. 
Yes. But they don't get the press on the media. Right. So um, unfortunately, what I've learned is um, I think if they're, you're coming from some negative background, uh, maybe some trauma or past hurts, it, like it, it, I think it does generationally um, carry on a bit. Um, but I've, but I've overcome that now. But I do believe that um, people, whether they lose a family member, get depressed. Mm-hmm. They grieve. I don't believe if someone loses a family member, they can be happy like, hey, I'm so happy. I'm really, I'm feeling good. So I feel that at least COVID-19 has opened up a conversation where people sadly who were struggling with mental health, it's not been great, the pandemic. But I do feel that more people have opened up talking about mental health or saying that you know they 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 have mental health or and then I just think you know isn't it more brain health like yes I so my idea is this Selena and you're a real brain nerd like me I've got this idea that I could get rid of the stigma by not calling it mental by just saying brain health <sighs> so my vision because I'm a visionary is that if you had a brain ward, because I've always believed you should have, you know, neuroscientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, brain surgeons all together. Right. And then if, because from what I understand, if, if the chemical uptake isn't happening, this is a brain functioning thing. Yes. And this brain is an organ. And I believe that if we learn that um, more about the brain, we could bring a lot of dignity to families who sadly lose people with brain illness. Yes. And we could, it could be a little bit easier for the person who maybe something isn't functioning, you know, quite well, but they're going to a brain ward. Yes a brain ward, and then we get rid of all the stigma. So, so <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. You're, you're 100% correct. And, you know, uh, as someone who worked in uh, neurological research for, you know, a, a good part of my career, we, we, we separate the neurological Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, epilepsy, MS, ALS, from the mental, and it is only one organ. <laughs> we don't have a mental br- part and a brain part. We just have the, or a neurologic part. We just have the brain. Unfortunately, um, you know, as we're exploring the final frontier, I think in in biomedical discovery, the brain is really like the last frontier where we don't know a lot of of things that's happening within the last, you know. 30 years, we, we were talking about neuroplasticity, the brain, the capacity for the brain to make new connections and things like that. So it really is a new frontier. I think one of the, you're absolutely right. When we talk about mental illness, it has such a, a longstanding historical uh, stigma attached to it that, you know, one of the reasons why, and I'll, I'll use this as a story, one of the reasons why I've been compliant with taking my medication for the last a couple months is that my psychiatrist, because I've I've never been compliant with my medications. <laughs> and uh during COVID, it got really bad that I was speaking to my psychiatrist every day. Every day we had to check in. It was I was getting so depressed, so bad. And then he says, Selena, are you taking your medication? No, I haven't taken my medication. Why not? I don't know. I just don't feel like taking it. I think I'll be okay without it. And he says, you have to realize that the hippocampus and he actually spoke about it as a in terms of the brain and he said the hippocampus there's something your hippocampus is damaged and your hippocampus is actually shaped like a a woman who's who's kind of like like this like you know um kneeling down with her arms stretched behind her head and she and he said don't you want to help that woman survive and i was like yes i want to help her survive 
And he said, well, take your medication. And I've never stopped taking it. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy for you. And I'm so glad because once we start looking at it as an organ, yes, then it's like it would be like having um, a liver or something wrong with your kidney or like right. as an example, uh, cancer or yeah. something or say oh, being a diabetic heart. yes exactly your heart. You have the, and your not heart taking the you know and not taking it and yeah. that's why i think once we start because i understand that you need the good healthy brain to function yeah. and like i've i've been telling people if your instructions isn't is isn't is like like a harmful um then your brain i always say brain but yeah. isn't isn't function isn't working like it should be you might have to no. you know and i because when i feel because we sadly would lose um many people because they're thinking it's their mindset like no. oh i've got to overcome my mindset you know it's because no. they think mental so they think mentality yes uh willpower yes and mind and because a lot of scientists don't know where the thought comes from. You know, like there's so much still unknown, but I feel that, yeah, go back to the organ. And so I hope more and more people right around the world would start exploring that because yeah. I feel we're shifting there slowly. We're slowly shifting there. Yeah. Uh, but it is taking some time. But that's really good that you're doing that. And um, because it's not nothing to do with you or anyone. Um, even when I was a farmer, like 100%, you're going to be a farmer, you're going to be depressed. 100%. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go broke on the land, you got to work seven days a week, you know, you've got no money. And a lot, so a lot of people living in poverty. Mm -hmm. sadly, if they're financially struggling, they're going to feel, you know, it's going to affect them because stress is a, as right. they say, a killer. Stress isn't good for the brain, as we know. But um, moving right along, I've gone on a for tangent here. Selena, this is your podcast show. I'm doing all the talking. Oh, my goodness. All right, let's go back to your book. So we got, we've done your self-care rituals. You are on fire. You're taking great care of yourself. You've reminded us. What inspired you to write the book? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I wanted sort of the lessons of my life to prepare the next generation for what success defined any way that you want to define it. Some of the obstacles that success bears and that, you know, your title doesn't protect you from sexism or racism or discrimination. You need to be prepared for that, 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 that it's going to happen. And, you know, I was, I was really inspired, especially by my, my own children, um, making sure that they don't feel the hurt that I've, that I've experienced, making sure that they don't have to deal with some of the pain. And even if they do, even if they do experience some of those pains, that they could reference the book and say, okay, how did mom deal with this? How did Selena deal with this? And know, okay, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out at the end. And, you know, I... I, I, I wanted it to be, my, my editor at one point said to me, Selena, what do you want this book to do, to do? Do you want this book to hurt or to heal? And I said, I wanted it to heal. And it didn't just heal me in terms of writing my story and, and emptying my cup of all the garbage. I wanted it to heal other people. I wanted them to know that there is, there is passion after your pain. There is purpose as a part of your hurt. And there is triumph after mistakes that are made and that it, it's it's going to be okay. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. That's so lovely. I love um, – and I was listening to one of your talks and you had young women who in this conversation they had children, uh, they were going to work, they had a partner. A few of them weren't practicing self-care. 
and you were kind enough to make sure that they find a way to build that self-care in so your book is really you're now really helping people as well as find their voice really focusing on the self-care component as well because that's often the part that goes out the window isn't it in a in a hype in any in a job or anyone striving to work up the corporate ladder or be in management or just even have a job yeah and and and, i mean we're busy we we want to hustle we want to do better for our families um we're, we're the sandwich generation where we have children but we also have elderly parents that we need to take care of where we're trying to do well in our jobs. We're trying to cook our meals. We're trying to clean our house. We're, tr- we're trying to do it all. And, and I often say that even Superman took off his cape every now and again. And you know what? Surprisingly, the world kept spinning, right? Yeah. Even, when, even when Superman took off his cape. So, so honestly, ladies, and this is not just for ladies, because like, I think yes. there's, there's some, um, individuals, um, men, persons with multiple intersecting identities who who just feel like they need to be at all, all the time for everyone except for themselves. And let me tell you one thing that is for certain. You cannot do anything for anyone at any time if you're not here. And it took me having a nervous breakdown and being in a hospital emergency room as an inpatient for four days to recognize that you you need to look after number one. It's not a selfish endeavor. It's not about being egotistical. It's not about being chauvinistic. It's about ensuring that you are surviving to take care of other people. And if it, if it means 15 minutes of nail polish, and that's that's why I have na- I have nail polish in every room in the house, multiple bottles of nail polish, because it is the one thing that I know for certain. If I do my nails, if I take the time to do it, that I will sit quietly and let them dry for 15 minutes because I'm a type A personality. I hate to see smudged nail polish. So I will sit, <laughs> I will sit quietly and not let them get smudged. <laughs> Yeah, so I love that. 15 minutes is. I know because you're such a go getter, and you know, I um, I was lucky when I grew up. We 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 weren't the culture of hustle wasn't as hectic as it is now. Um, hustle is just like a badge of honor, but yeah. we know if you hustle too much, you burn out, and. I mean, I've experienced burnout myself, and I'm sure most women have. Most men, most people, like if you keep going, going, going and working seven days a week from, you know, the morning to the midnight or whatever, and your mind is always thinking and, you know, you do burn out with no self-care, so you have to take care. I want to ask you, um, there's this, everybody talks about being authentic it's a catchphrase now be your authentic self be your authentic self um sometimes people might think but my authentic self isn't really accepted or people uh it's not a positive thing to share or they don't feel them their authentic self. How can someone be their authentic self? <laughs> like, you know, obviously they have to get to know who they are first. Would that be the first tip? How to be yes. your authentic self? Yeah. So first, do you mind if I read part of the book? To, to yes, say that? yes yeah. that would be amazing. So, so first of all, you have to know yourself, but then you also have to be safe because in some places it's not safe to be your 100% authentic self. But I'll just read a, a paragraph that says, many who have witnessed me trying to my best to speak and act from an authentic place have asked me if being authentic works in business or politics. That is a difficult question to answer because authenticity is a struggle. Don't get me wrong. It is not a struggle because I don't know how to be authentic. That I do know. It is a struggle because authenticity is just as multifaceted 
as the idea of a leadership. It can't always, I can't always be singing the one note. I need to take different approaches to the different situations and challenges that arise. So do we all. Some situations require us to be quiet. Others require us to speak audibly and clearly. Other times we are required to shout and take it to the streets. Authenticity is not one dimensional. Authenticity is understanding how to use every single part of you, your flaws, your strengths, your weaknesses, your mistakes, your joys and your triumphs to make a situation whole. That is what authenticity is. And you, you know when to bring your authentic self, which parts of your authentic self to a given situation. And that is authenticity. I love that. So you know when to bring it forward. You're right. There are some situations where it wouldn't fly talking mm -hmm. about your being your authentic self. It might go down like a lead balloon or it yeah. might not be safe. You know, yeah. you might not be supported. Right. Um, you talk a lot about support. I'm a big believer in if we are going to make a difference, then say the woman who has 100 followers on Instagram and she's trying to make a difference, like we need to support people trying to make a difference. So you're big on that, aren't you? Like um, in your case, you were in business and in politics. So obviously women in leadership getting together and supporting each other globally. Yes. So, so yeah, you know what? I, I think in this particular time and age, you know, we have, we hear a lot of people talking about their woke, right? They're, they're, they're all of a sudden they're aware of the global pandemic. They're aware of inequality. They're aware of certain things. And this doesn't mean that we, it's time to reinvent the wheel. This is not time for doing that, people, especially to our allies, especially to people who want to help, who want to support. This is not time to say, well, I'm going to start something new and do something new. This is the time when you donate to organizations that are already doing good work. This is the time where you lend your resources to people who are already doing the good work. This is the time where you volunteer to support others who are already doing good work. This is not the time to start to be egotistical. This is the time to put your egos to the side and say, hey, I know that there are people out there who are really struggling and they're doing some good things. Let me see how I could support them. Let me add my myself, my resources, my time, my donation, my finances to what they are doing and support them, augment them, bake that bigger pie and create the equity that the world needs. This is not time for ego. This is time for equity. This is time for you to remove yourself and to help others who have often been left behind. I love that, to help others who are often been left behind. Yes, because in Canada, you're in Canada, are you still in lockdown now? Or yeah, you've, yes. have you come out of lockdown? Are you no. still in lockdown? So it depends on where you are. Um, so yeah. I'm, in, I'm in Whitby, which is 40 minutes east of Toronto. Toronto has just moved to, from a black lockdown to a gray lockdown, meaning a uh, you know essential services could open 50%, non-essential services could open 25%. Basically, they're still in lockdown. Where my brother lives an hour away is still in lockdown. So, you know, the, the pandemic is spreading in St. John's in Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada. They've just gone back to lockdown completely because a new, the, the British variant of the strain has been uh, resurfacing there. So it's ebbing and flowing for, for a lot of Canada. And um, it's, a, it's a serious situation that we're in. Yeah, and I, you have mentioned... Uh, my mum and actually were talking about this yesterday because one of your talks, you mentioned that uh, black women or or people of colour are affected with this COVID-19. We're hearing a lot of that 
coming out. And is that because of their low immune system or because they are living in what is this? Why poverty and maybe not eating as healthy food as say someone very wealthy or yeah. got like a very a very good paying job and living in good housing conditions? So so yes. So as we know that the virus does not discriminate, it hits everybody the same. Mm. What does discriminate though is the social determinants of health, where you live your ability to have access to healthcare, your ability to have sick benefits so you could stay home from work when you're sick, your ability to make a living wage. Most of the, the frontline workers who are working on those frontline jobs are racialized people. And when we think about in, in Toronto, for example, this, the city of Toronto, 52% uh, of the city of Toronto is racialized people they bear 80% of the burden of COVID-19. 9% of the population of the city of Toronto is black. They bear 30, 30% of the impact of COVID-19. And it's because of these other social determinants. Their housing is, is infrastructure is, is poor, um, which leads to the fact that, you know, they don't have access to mental health services, proper access to health care services, proper access to paid sick leave. So you have to go to work when you're sick. Otherwise, you don't get paid. How, how do you expect people to live and survive? This is killing people. And, and we really need to pay attention, I think, all governments around the world to how we respond to COVID-19. Because Yvette, if we are on this podcast 20 years from now, and we look back at this moment, we want to be able to say that we did the best for the most vulnerable person. And if we are able to do that and allow them to survive, everybody else will survive this pandemic. Oh, that's really, thank you for sharing that, Selena. I couldn't help think how grateful I am to live in Australia, such a great country, because the people who couldn't go to work did get paid by the government to yeah. stay home. Right. Our government paid people and employment uh, employers uh, COVID-19 money. And some people got paid more money than they were when they were going, like more money staying at home compared to if they went to work. So I think our government was paying $600 or it might have been 650 Australian dollars a week for someone to stay at home. Um, yes. during COVID. So yes. we've been so lucky, like we're so supported where people sick, even if they're casual, would yes. get paid. So we've we've had the capacity, our governments have stepped up too and, and offered uh, paid leave. Um, but when once that ended, um, and, and again, for those who are, are precarious workers, uh, often frontline, often who don't have the paid benefits from their employer, they were forced to go back to work mm. or forced to go back without the proper um, protective gear. They were forced to go back uh, knowing that they weren't well. So there's, there's even when we had the, the, the government infrastructure, the, sa the safety net to help some, there were a lot of people who fell through the cracks and most of them were racialized. Most of them were, were black and most of them were women. Ah, oh, wow. Yeah, black and women. Yeah. But it's good that we're talking about this today and raising awareness because if you don't listen or don't want to learn, you'll never know. Yes. Um, and so I feel that it's interesting to learn from each, like you said, learn from each other country and learn about what's happening in your country or what's happening in your country and then just sharing of information we can be more compassionate and have more empathy yes um and so many people are struggling they're really hurting even you know the people that had to stay at home people yeah. have lost their jobs especially international Australia closed all of our borders, international travel ceased, 
and it has since March, um, unless you're coming back in or, or out for work. It's been a challenging time. Um, what would be your advice, Selena, for someone out there who's kind of struggling, they're sick of the pandemic, they want it to be over? I've spoken to a few entrepreneurs who sort of have said we need to be patient, we need to have faith, uh, we need to stay connected. We need to keep communicating and and find people to support us and just to to feel supported. What are your thoughts on that? So I, I think, you know, right now when we're living in a global pandemic and, and also talking about racial inequality, one of the things that we really need to do is make those connections, is to connect to people, connect to our tasks at work, connect to our mission, vision, values in our spaces that we exist in. Um, you know, it, it, we're social beings as, as human beings. And, and to make those, and to all of a sudden be removed from those connections is, is, crit is, is harmful to our existence. And hence the reason why you see that increase in, in, um, in mental illness, in, in depression, anxiety, et cetera, and mood disorders. So, so it is important to make those connections as best as possible. The other thing is, is to check in on each other, to have those conversations with the unusual suspects people that you don't normally talk to, this is an opportunity to create that empathy, Yvette, that you talked to so eloquently about during this podcast, to be able to say to, to someone else, hey, uh, we, you know, I, 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 I want to connect with you. I want to understand your story. I want to listen. I want to have that capacity to understand who you are, what struggles you go through, and, and at least acknowledge you. I think this is the time in, in 2021 post 2020, 2020 wasn't just a series of historical moments. It was a call to action to do things differently. Now we need to challenge ourselves to say, what are you going to do differently? And even if it is just creating that empathy, even if it's just the time that you take to listen, to understand something about someone who is not the person that you sleep with at night or you go home and have dinner with at night, somebody different than that then that is what we need to ensure that this historical moment is not lost. Yeah, I love that. I love those words of wisdom. And it's something I'm doing more and more of. Like at the moment, people are talking about being Asian and yes. how that's affecting them because people are coming at them, blaming them for starting COVID. Yes. But I'm listening and I'm reading. I'm reading yes. real people's feelings and many of these people even in Australia were born in Australia um, <laughs> but they have Asian uh, backgrounds or yes. and it's happening in America we see for we sure see it everywhere in, yeah so I always remind people that uh, it's not the people you know they, these people are just like you or I so like we can't get we can't blame anyone for starting COVID we just have to accept it's here and, and how can we do the best by each other, knowing that everybody's struggling in their own way, whether that's paying right. bills or people. Like, we love going out to the coffee shop. Like, we're really lucky in Australia we're not in a lockdown and we're able to go to the coffee shop, we're able to go shopping, um, able to go outdoors. It's summertime, Selena. It's... Uh, you know, blue so sky, lovely. sunshine, 30 degrees. I mean, it's really hard to get too upset where yeah. I live because it's sort of summer all the time. But, um, yeah, I feel that more empathy, compassion um, and just being open. I, I'm just spending more time learning from other cultures or people that I didn't normally necessarily wouldn't hang out with men and women of all ages. Yes. Um, and and it's really interesting. So now I could talk to you forever, Selena, um, and we're going over time and I'm conscious of your time. But before we say goodbye, I want to ask you this. How does it feel to see your book in the window right beside one of um, 
one of the incredible world leaders, Baraka Obama. Uh, I can. Ne I hope I got that right with my Aussie oh, accent. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But how does it feel to see your book there? Um, it must feel incredible to see your book in the bookshops and the books and yeah. How does it feel? You know, it, it, there's been such a great reception to this book. It debuted in Canada, number four on the national bestseller list. I'm really excited about it. But, I, you know, I think, Yvette, to be honest, that those kind of accolades are secondary to the fact that when people email me or send me messages, they say that they resonate with the book, that they see themselves in the book, that the stories in the book, that they they cry and they laugh and they get angry and they throw the book and they pick it up and they curse and they, they all the emotions that I felt in writing the book that they feel themselves. And that for me is the beauty of stories. Stories are sticky. And when a, whenever you're able to connect your sticky story to someone else's and create, build back that humanity that has been lost with racism and xenophobia and homophobia and all these other discriminations, when you're able to build back those threads of humanity one at a time through our stories, that is the beauty of this book. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really quite proud of it, not because it's a national bestseller, but because it resonates so powerfully with people. Yeah, that's so beautiful because in a few of your interviews, you talked about walking through Parliament um, and not seeing, you know, women on the walls or not seeing even anyone of colour. And another interview you did, which was uh, after four years going in and people were asking you for your credentials, and you were really the only black <laughs> Selena Caesar van going in and you're a bit like, hang on a minute, you know, like um, so yeah. obviously and you did talk about in some of your interviews I was listening how you would turn up in the meeting and then people would be like looking for that parliamentary secretary expecting it to be someone other than you. Yeah. Um, so you have gone through um, an interesting period. And you know what I thought, Selena? I have this idea, so radical. If I could just get, I would just wipe all the books. You know, for me, I feel like I'd just take down all those photos and everything and just start fresh. Like 2020, new beginning, new everything. I'd do the same in Australia too. Um, yeah. And just start fresh we are well, so hell-bent on tradition i understand tradition is good and recognizing but at the same time remodeling yes redesigning would be great well well that's what we talk about when we when we talk about dismantling the, the status quo and and you know here talk about dismantling sort of white supremacy like we, we really need to break those down bit brick by brick and understand the contribution indigenous people um, have had to the, the development, the, 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 the stewardship of the land from the beginning, you know, understand the contributions that various um, racial, ethnic uh, individuals have had to the social, political and economic development of a lot of countries. And when, especially when you talk about black communities um, through the, the history of slavery and many, uh, many, uh, countries, especially in the West and in, in Europe, the development of the economies of those countries from the belly of Africa, you know, we we we, we owe sort of a, a debt to that contribution mm -hmm. and to have it erased from our infrastructure of our systems is so terribly wrong. Yeah. And, and you know, and we're not going to we're not going to correct it unless we dismantle. First of all, we have to acknowledge that it exists and then we have to dismantle and move forward. I love that. Acknowledge it exists and dismantle and move forward because, um, you know, it's been just an absolute pleasure meeting with you today, Selena. I'm Thank just so you. grateful that we got to celebrate the launch of your book um, here in Australia and when I first spotted your book, apart from I love the colour pink, can you hear me now? Um, you know, like 
it just really resonated with me and people want to know how to show up, be their authentic self, speak their truth. But it also I feel that it's very it's very rare to have women mm -hmm. in parliament as well, but you've been an entrepreneur, then you went into politics and now you've come out the other end where you're going to focus more on that empowerment and um, leading because you're going to be doing work in organisations, um, helping yeah. them, yes. but also helping people of all um, ages and women of all colour, but to help them empower themselves to live a better life for and sure. to, you know, live their own dreams. So I feel that you've had such great experience, but now you can sort of move on. And I think um, now with COVID, your work is so needed uh, moving forward. So, Selena, thank you again for being on the Spirit Girl thank podcast you. show. I could talk to you forever, um, forever you so and much. ever and ever. We are so grateful that your book is out and. Isn't it amazing that someone wanted Penguin, um, especially in Canada, wanted to share your story? Yeah. And you know what? I have to say that you say you love the cover. The cover of the book was designed and uh, by my 16-year-old, Candace, and she actually got the contract with Penguin. So not only did Penguin you know, write, come up and, and publish the story, but they gave her the contract to design the cover of the book, which I'm going to be forever grateful to Penguin for seeing, you know, at the time, 15 year old girl and saying, this is a great concept. Um, we'll, we're we're going to give you a contract to do the cover of the book. Oh so my goodness. Yeah. That's so amazing. <laughs> amazing because that's really she's, she's the one that was at clayfield in uh in australia so there's oh a little bit of an australian connection there yeah there is because i love the cover of the book i mean who wouldn't yeah. want to read it can you hear me now and um the cover of the book and the and the title because the title's really you're really sharing everything which i yeah. feel is like that's hard being vulnerable yeah. Even I, I struggle at times being vulnerable. Yeah. I used to feel like, oh, if I told someone I was Aboriginal, never did, but yeah. because I didn't want them to feel sorry for me, pity me. Right. Uh, I didn't want them to think less of me. I always right. wanted to get there on my own merits. It's just right. Yvette Lee Blowitz, and it's you on your own credit, you on your right. hard work, you on your own right. merit. Because once you put in a particular label, race, a whole lot of other crap comes into it, you know. So, um, but Selena, I'm going to say good evening to you in Toronto. You. We'll say hello um, to all of our podcast listeners. Thank you for being so open and honest, Selena, Caesar, Shiv Van, Van, get that yeah. right. Um, we will say goodbye to Selena. Selena, thank you again for everything you have done. Thank you. It's an honour that you uh, have decided to write this book to help other people. I can't wait for everyone of our Spirit Girl podcast listeners globally to grab a copy. In Australia, we can grab it off Booktopia. I really hope for our listeners tuning in, you learnt something new today. Um, it's just opened your eyes to be more open, just to tune into other people's stories. I always say don't judge a, a book by its cover, but in your case you can because the cover is beautiful. So grab it, grab it, grab it. I really hope it makes the Oprah Winfrey Book Club oh, now. thank you. That such has to happen. The Oprah Winfrey Book Club, we'll do a big shout out to them. I've got my own book club, but. Um, I'm really looking forward to watching your journey unfold. And if we're here in 20 years' time, I'll be 63. So, um, <laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah, so it's a really special time. I'm super grateful that we're here in these um, challenging times. So thank you again, Selena. We will say goodbye to our beautiful guests. Thank you, Selena. 
So to everyone, thank you for tuning into the Spirit Girl Talk Show podcast. Be sure to subscribe, leave a five-star rating and review, and to tell someone you love too. And together, let's feel good from within. Bye for now.